Rivals raced against time to gain rights to Tetris in the 2023 film, but not everything in the film was fact. Car chases, licensing lawsuits, and KGB's involvement. It all sounds dramatized, but was it really? Here's the fact from fiction to how the blocks really fell. In Tetris, viewers are told that Russian programmer Alexei Pajitnov, played by Nikita Efremov, invented the game on a primitive computer. But there is much more to the man and how he made one of the most popular video games of all time. In the film, Pajitnov is working in part for the trade bureau Elorg, but in actuality, he was employed by the Russian Academy of Sciences, a think tank of scientists, writers, and philosophers who were often given far more freedom than most. In the mid-1980s, Pajanov was working on early efforts into developing artificial intelligence. He had a passion for computer game design and often used the availability of new hardware to dabble in programming his own puzzles. When it came to the original game of Tetris, Alexei Pajitnov was heavily inspired by a game from his youth called Pentamenos, a generic block game in which players rearrange different shapes, constructed out of five squares to make a solid rectangle. One look at the game, and it's hard not to recognize it as the inspiration for Pajitnov's digital masterpiece. Pajitnov's first attempt was essentially a computer translation of Pentamenos, but he soon landed on the idea of falling game pieces that could be rotated. But when he added the feature of completed rows disappearing, Tetris was truly born. Why can't both lines disappear at once instead of one at a time? Uh, because, uh, I never thought of that. <laughs> When Tetris came to the Nintendo and Game Boy in the 1980s, it became an instant classic. But these ports certainly weren't the first time anyone played the game outside of the Soviet Union. While the film largely passes that part of the game's history, the real arrival of Tetris in the West is fascinating. As it's repeatedly mentioned in the film, the rights to the game on computers had been acquired by Robert Stein and licensed to Mirrorsoft, a key video game publisher in the United Kingdom throughout the 1980s. They successfully launched the game in the UK for computers, but they weren't its only manufacturer. This is something the movie never mentions. In fact, Tetris wound up being successfully released in the United States by Mirosoft's subsidiary Spectrum Holobyte, selling more than 100,000 copies. To market the game, Spectrum Holobyte decided to embrace the game's Russian roots, using box art with Cyrillic text and images of the iconic St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow, enticing Western gamers with a small peek behind the Iron Curtain. The film opens with Hank Rogers, played by Taron Edgerton, attending an electronics expo and trade show, unsuccessfully hawking his video game version of the classic Chinese board game Go. While there, his hired helper is distracted by a booth showing off Tetris, which lures him over to reluctantly try it. While it is true that Rogers developed a title for Nintendo based on Go, what the movie doesn't say is that, at the time, Rogers primarily made his living by looking for titles to import to Japan. Discovering Tetris was exactly why he went to those trade shows in the first place. Mirosoft control all rights on all platforms worldwide. Is Japan available? Rogers claimed that he spotted Tetris in the 1988 Winter Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, where Spectrum Holobyte was showing off their Russian puzzle game. He would explain years later, Tetris was probably the quietest game at the show. This game was a totally different thing. I wanted to play it because it struck some basic chord. I couldn't stop playing. Allegedly, Rogers was so entranced by the game, he got back in line to play it over and over, convinced that Tetris was precisely what the Japanese market was craving. Apple TV's Tetris is a dramatic reenactment of Hank Rogers' trip to the Soviet Union and his negotiations for the Japanese rights to the titular video game. It's revealed at the film's climax that Sofia Lebedeva Sasha, who Rogers randomly picked out of a crowd to serve as his translator, is actually an undercover KGB operative. This reveal is meant to throw the audience for a loop, but it might surprise viewers to learn that in reality, Roger's Russian interpreter did turn out to be a KGB agent. However, unlike in the film, it was no secret. When the real Hank Rogers took his trip to Russia, the woman he hired was named Ola. As Rogers wrote in an editorial for The Guardian in 2014, he did pick her from a group of people in the lobby of his hotel, though the major difference between the movie and history was that Rogers was very much in the know that he was surrounded by agents of the state. They were all KGB, but Ola was beautiful and very perky when everybody else was doom and gloom. Just as in the film, Ola took Rogers to Elor, but according to Rogers, Ola refused to enter the building with him, and her part in his negotiations ended there. The film's notion that she worked with Elor to intimidate him or was involved in a sinister government plot was totally fabricated. Set mostly in 1988, the Tetris film sees Hank Rogers attempting to secure the rights to produce the game for the Nintendo Entertainment System in Japan. However, he is told early on by Nintendo's CEO to visit their subsidiary in Seattle, Washington. When there, he discovers their American team working on a prototype for the Game Boy. Company lawyer Howard Lincoln, played by Ben Miles, tells him they're planning on releasing it with a handheld version of their biggest franchise, Super Mario Land. Believing that it'll help sell the new system to a broader audience, Roger suggests that the Game Boy be packaged with Tetris instead. 
They are instantly receptive, and the company's lack of the handheld rights to the title kicks off the plot which sends Rogers to Russia. While these broad strokes remain true, what the movie fails to mention is that Nintendo always hoped to launch the Game Boy with Tetris. It wasn't Rogers' idea at all. Industry giant Nintendo were about to launch a handheld game playing device and wanted to sell Tetris as part of the package. In the 2004 documentary Tetris from Russia with Love, it was claimed that Lincoln already had a preloaded version of the game on the Game Boy when the device was first shown to Rogers. It was then that the intrepid licensor knew he had to get them the rights they needed to make it a reality. In the film, after seeing the promise of the upcoming Game Boy, Rogers flies to England to secure handheld rights to Tetris from Mirosoft. When he arrives, Mirosoft's licensed intermediary Robert Stein, played by Toby Jones, is also there. When Rogers approaches the topic of handheld rights, Stein and the Maxwell's demeanors suggest to Rogers that nobody actually owned the handheld rights outside of the Soviet Union. Rogers does offer to pay $25,000 to Stein for worldwide handheld rights, but after it's leaked in the next scene that Stein turned around to sell handheld rights to Atari, Rogers then flies to Moscow to get them for himself. However, the truth isn't quite as dramatic. As revealed in Tetris from Russia with Love, Rogers actually approached Stein asking for the dealmaker to go to Moscow to help him secure the handheld rights to Tetris. Stein was often negotiating on behalf of multiple clients, so this wasn't out of the ordinary, but Rogers became nervous. He said he was going to go to Russia, and he kept on saying that, and he wasn't going, so I became really suspicious. The truth was that Stein was working on handheld rights for Mirosoft, prompting Rogers to hop on a plane to secure the rights on his own. In one pivotal scene in the film, Rogers helps Nikolai Belikov, the company director of Elorg, understand how Mirosoft was able to acquire video game rights to the game without realizing it. He points out that computers were never explicitly defined, and gives him advice on how to ensure the mistake doesn't happen again. But according to the real-life Hank Rogers, his involvement in restructuring contracts for Belikov and Elorg was more far-reaching than simply helping him to find computers. To get what he was looking for, Rogers knew he had to be open and helpful, and part of that openness meant drafting a contract that was favorable to both sides. With Rogers eschewing typical hard-selling negotiations, the Russians eventually granted him console rights. He told The Guardian in 2014, I gave them the best contract I've ever seen in the industry, clear, concise, no bullshit, partly because there wasn't time for any renegotiations. Not only was the new contract helpful to Rogers getting the rights he needed, it was also helpful to Belikov and Elorg, with Rogers claiming Elorg used the Tetris negotiations as a template for all their other deals. But this didn't sit well with the Maxwells, who, as shown in the film, often used the Soviets' negotiating inexperience with capitalists to their advantage. Some of the most intense moments in the film involve Belikov's attempts to outwit his three Western rivals, Robert Stein, Hank Rogers, and Kevin Maxwell, who are all in Moscow competing to get console and handheld rights. Belikov repeatedly pits the three parties against each other, keeping them separated and using information from them to squeeze out a better deal. While this is partly true, the movie portrays Belikov as a largely naive official who hasn't a clue who Hank Rogers is or what he wants. In truth, Belikov was alerted to his arrival by government agents. You don't walk into a place like that uninvited. You have to have an invitation, and then your invitation has to be cleared with the KGB. Similarly, the movie includes a corrupt KGB agent, played by Igor Grabuzov, who blackmails the Maxwells and forces Belikov to sign the rights away to Mirosoft. This kickstarts a complicated scheme where Pajitnov sends a covert fax to Rogers to help him steal back the rights. The real-life negotiations weren't quite as dramatic. While it is true that the Maxwells tried to exert pressure on Belikov by calling in favors from Mikhail Gorbachev, the general secretary of the USSR, in reality there was no nefarious KGB blackmail scheme. Belikov favored Rogers because of the man's honesty. Alexei Pajitnov also played a much larger role in negotiations than the movie suggests, pushing Belikov to give Rogers the rights. In the film, Rogers first visits Nintendo in Japan to sell them on Tetris, meeting with CEO Hiroshi Yamauchi, played by Togo Igawa. After a quick negotiation, he agrees to Rogers producing Tetris as an official Nintendo licensee. But that doesn't quite tell the whole story. It may surprise longtime video game fans to learn that legendary game designer Shigeru Miyamoto, creator of Mario, The Legend of Zelda, and Donkey Kong, actually had a small part to play in the story of Tetris. As detailed in Norman Caruso's online documentary, The Story of Tetris, Yamauchi was less enthusiastic than how he was portrayed in the movie. He did have a passing interest in the game, but wanted a second opinion. He turned to Miyamoto, the company's biggest creative force at the time, who gave his boss a thumbs up on Tetris. When asked why it was worth bringing to Nintendo, he said plainly, because your secretaries and accountants are playing it. The biggest players in Tetris aren't gamers, but video game publishers. This includes Atari, Nintendo's biggest rival at the time, 
Their involvement in the film keeps them largely in the background as a looming threat, when reality was a little more complex. Wait, you're telling me Atari doesn't have Tetris in America? I'm telling you, Atari doesn't have Tetris anywhere! According to the story of Tetris, while Atari snagged the rights to consoles and arcade versions of Tetris for Japan, they were far more interested in making the game in the U.S. than in the East. In fact, Hank Rogers actually secured his deal for the Japanese territory before the mess with the Russians muddied the waters. But in the aftermath of the events of the film, with Rogers and Nintendo winding up with console rights, Nintendo immediately sent a cease and desist letter to Atari, and Atari responded by suing Nintendo. To settle the dispute, ELORG director Nikolai Belokov actually came to the United States and testified in the court case. The judgment was swift, and suddenly Atari found themselves without rights to Tetris, and they were forced to pull thousands of copies from store shelves. To this day, the Atari version remains a valuable collector's item. Those who have seen the 2023 Tetris movie can probably agree that some of the most exciting moments are in the film's climax. After Rogers brings two Nintendo executives with him to Moscow, he convinces Belikov to go against KGB orders to do a deal with Mirosol, granting Rogers and Nintendo the rights they were after. With a signed contract in hand, the trio rush to get out of the country before corrupt government operatives can get to them. This leads to a nail-biting car chase through Moscow's crowded streets, which concludes with a foot chase through an airport. It probably won't shock you to learn that much of this was invented for the movie. Truthfully, while Rogers did return to Moscow after Belikov received pressure to sign the rights to the Maxwells, it wasn't nearly as ominous. Since there was no KGB blackmail scheme, they weren't trying to have Rogers arrested. Also, while the film claims Rogers brings along the Nintendo executives because he needs their deep pockets to sign the deal, it was really because Belikov requested they come along. He needed help in order to convince his contacts in the Russian government that working with Nintendo was simply the better deal. Sure, every film needs to end somewhere, and the Tetris movie didn't have the time to dramatize what ultimately happened to the game and the people involved. But even with a handful of real-life photographs and a few brief updates during the credits, the film mostly glosses over what happened to Rogers and Pajanov after Tetris became a cultural phenomenon. Is now a good time for American emotion? In the initial wake of the game's success, its Russian developers saw no profits. After the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, Pajitnov moved his family to the United States. Five years later, he and Rogers started the Tetris Company, which finally gave Pajitnov royalties on the game and its associated merchandise. Not long afterwards, Pajitnov took a staff job at Microsoft as their first in-house game designer, where he remained until 2005. As for Rogers, he branched out into other industries, founding Blue Planet Energy, a renewable energy storage company, and International Moonbase Alliance, which aims to create livable settlements on the moon and Mars. 